my grandmother moved from Memphis three hours away to another city, which was Nashville. So when she moved to Nashville, I went and visited her one time, bro. And when I went and visited her, it was a um, white people out jogging. And when they were out jogging, this is how naive I was, bro. She spoke to me. The white lady waved at me first. And when she waved at me first, I was like, what? <laughs> these white people are actually friendly mm. like this it wasn't like that in my hometown it was different so when she spoke to me i was like oh yeah this is a nice place let me see what's going on here <laughs> you have to lose the mindset that our african brothers and sisters hate us. Mm. like we were taught that you guys hate us and don't want to deal with us and don't want to be connected with us so there's mm. like this hesitancy to connect hesitancy to really trust and interact with each other so we have to lose that mindset that we were taught that they don't trust you they gonna they sold you into slavery they really gonna try to send you back when our african-american brothers and sisters get here it's important that we take the season to just stay in our own and deal with our family issues deal with the healing that we have to deal with before we come into society and hurt the same people that we want to build with. Mm. My mother was able to get food stamps from the state. I wanted to play basketball, so I thought, okay, my mother doesn't have the money, mm -hmm. but we get these food stamps. Mm -hmm. And I know the people at my school love to eat snacks. So what I did was I used some of the food stamp money mm -hmm. in order to buy a bunch of snacks for me to sell in order to make the money for my uniform. So I always would think of different ways to use what we have in order to get what I needed to get. When I first came, I was very naive and wide open, bro. Like, I'm talking about wide open. I thought if you was black, we was cool. Like, if, if you say uh, Shalom, if you say Welcome Back to Africa, if you say Let's Build My African American Brother, I'm running with you. But now I learned, like, you gotta look at that person work, look at what they've been doing, look at what they built, look at what they working on, look at their mindset. There's so many different things that we have to look at before we decide to move forward. I wish I would have knew that all skin folk, not kin folk. Mm. We can't afford to still be fearful. We can't afford to be, uh, there's this 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 fear of the white boogeyman mm. that we as people deal with. The white boogeyman, you know. Mm -hmm. There's been things that happened in history to a mm -hmm. lot of our leaders and a lot of our people from white crazy people. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our people are crippled mm -hmm. by moving on their instincts and moving on their calling because they feel like the white man gonna come get them. Mm. Like, I'm sure with you, when you started this platform, when you started to talk about it, you had those thoughts like, man, what if they come kill me? Mm. What if they try to come take me out mm. for doing this work? <laughs> so a lot of people watching this mm. don't want to come to Africa because they feel like, oh man, white people gonna come hurt me, they gonna come get me. And that's what stops us and what's keeping us from going to where we need to go. It's that fear of being scared of them, bro. We don't have to be scared of them. But it's real. History happened. Yeah, we got hurt. Yeah, some people were murdered. But if you stand up on top of those people's shoulders who were murdered and stand strong for them, well, they can't kill all of them. We got to keep working and stay strong. Hello, guys, and welcome back again to another amazing episode. And as you guys already know, this is the Diaspora Transition episode where we have dialogue with diasporans uh, who are currently living here on the continent. And uh, today we are here in Zanzibar, Tanzania. You know, I came all the way from Ghana. Um, it, we have someone special here today. You know, he goes by the name uh, Tim Ford Jr. Uh, he relocated to the continent, you know, to Tanzania four years ago with his whole family. I'm here to ask him why did he do that? What triggered that decision? And so without further ado, Tim Ford, welcome on the show, man. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Hey, yeah. Thank, thank you. you thank me, you for man. being on the show and coming yeah. out here. Too, yes, you know. man. Um, the people I watch you, I've seen you everywhere. Every now and then I see your, your videos on Instagram. It get recommended to me. Uh, I like the things you preach on your channel. Thank you. Um, Thank you. People are watching for the first time. They might not know who you are. Can you briefly introduce yourself mm -hmm. to the people watching for the first time? Right. Well, first, thank you for having me, brother. I appreciate you for inviting me to your platform and sharing what you've been able to build, man. I'm grateful to be able to come on here my and pleasure, share bro. my story, brother. Appreciate my pleasure, it again, bro. man. My pleasure. Yes. But yes, my name is uh, Tim Ford Jr. I moved over here to the continent of Africa four years ago, and um, I've been over here building businesses with my wife and actually building communities and helping people return and showing my journey on YouTube and Instagram to inspire people that's coming from America to come to Africa and also our African brothers and sisters here on the continent to look at the reality of what we can do here in Africa. Hmm. Yeah. But how did Africa come into the picture for you though? Mm -hmm. Because like you're African-American. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. 
Did, did he had roots like family here that you can point to? Yeah, no, bro. Believe it or not, um, just like um, many of us in America, bro, I was brainwashed to not even want to look at Africa. Really? Yeah, I felt like this place, uh, unfortunately, was just like somewhere we didn't belong. Mm -hmm. Somewhere where, honestly, bro, I was taught that, um, you know, we're in this nice building now, but um, I was under the impression that it was still the jungle. Lions, tigers, lion, yeah, right yeah, bro, running around with the zebras and things. That's what they, what I envisioned. And four years ago, when I got here, bro, in Dar es Salaam, I saw the mall that they had here for the first time ever, bro. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know there was malls over here until wow. I got here, bro. Really? Yes, bro. So I wasn't thinking about Africa until mm -hmm. something happened in our life. Honestly, man. Mm -hmm. What yeah. happened? So um, basically, bro, we were in. I was living in Nashville at the time and I was married to my wife and we were in the process of trying to find somewhere else to live. Mm -hmm. And at the time our lease was up. So we went house hunting for like maybe one or two days. And when we went house hunting, bro, it just felt very uncomfortable. It mm. felt weird. Like, you know, in that society over there, we aren't allowed to be black. Like we have to tuck our black in and really make them comfortable. So we knew whatever place we tried to move into, it wouldn't be somewhere where we're comfortable. Mm. So my wife and I, we decided just to sit and pray and really ask for direction, bro. And my wife ended up having a dream, bro, mm. that we were actually in Africa, in Tanzania to be specific. She saw the mountain of Kilimanjaro in the background in her dream. And she mm. heard God tell her to come and pave the way to help our people. So she woke up and told me about their dream. And I was like, yeah, that's it. It's time that's to go, up. bro. Yeah. Just like that. Bro, just like that. It was like, um... Because keep in mind, we was, our lease was about to be up, so mm -hmm. we had to go. You had no choice. Yeah, we had no choice. So it was like either try to find somewhere in America mm -hmm. or let's just go to Africa and build from there. And you've been here four years now. Four years, bro. But let, let's, because I see what you talk about, even on your YouTube channel, what mm -hmm. you preach. You, you seem to have a very unique mindset. Thank you. That mindset comes from like an experience, yeah. you know, the woke mindset. Yeah, like, woke, woke. Because, because like you, you question everything. You're like, bro. Why are they telling me Africa is this, that, that? Man. I don't believe it. Let me just go find it for myself. Yeah. Right? Something happened. Where did that start for you? You know, yeah. being woke and even your, let's go back to the beginning. Your upbringing. Who did you grow up with? Mm -hmm. How was your childhood like? Yeah. So, um, man, I grew up questioning everything. Like, of course, I was trying to figure out everything that was going on. Mm -hmm. But in terms of my upbringing, bro, um, I didn't grow up in a two parent household. My mother and father were separated and mm -hmm. I literally never seen my mother and father in a healthy relationship. I mm -hmm. never seen them kiss. I never seen them hug. I don't even know what it's like to see them together, bro. What? Yes, bro. Ever since I've been born, I've just witnessed them like be like, um, baby mother and baby father, bro. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of dysfunction within that. So I grew up around a lot of dysfunction, bro. Mm -hmm. It was so bad that, um, at a young age, bro, I remember um, telling my father because, you know, every son wants to do what his father does and right. be like his dad. So my dad used to call my mom his baby mother. So I told my dad one day, like, Dad, I can't wait to have a baby mama like you, bro. Wow. And he was like, ah, son, no, like, you don't mm -hmm. need to have a baby mama. Like, that's not how it goes. You're supposed to want to get married. So I was like five or six, bro, and I remember saying that. And when he said, like, you're supposed to have a wife, it changed. When he said, I was like, okay, that's what I need to do. And I watched my mother, bro. Um, like my dad was there and he taught me principles about working. He taught me principles about entrepreneurship. When I would go to his house, mm -hmm. I would spend weekends there. And sometimes I would spend summers with him to learn the principles of working. But for the most part, I was with my mother, bro. Mm -hmm. And watching her struggle really like forced me to think in different ways to be able to provide like i didn't want to keep asking her for stuff because i hated mm -hmm. to hear no mm -hmm. and then like i knew that she was struggling and she hated to tell me no mm -hmm. so i wanted to figure out okay how can i not stress my mother out and figure it out on my own mm -hmm. yeah what was some of the stress you saw her going through like what as what does she even do from day to day how mm -hmm. was her life like how did she how was she holding up? Mm -hmm. You know, how did you observe? You know, what did you observe during this time? Good question, bro. So my mother, bro, she had me when she was 16, bro. Mm -hmm. So she, she has sort of like a, a limited education. So she wasn't able to get a degree and mm -hmm. she wasn't able to get like a high paying job like she wanted. Mm -hmm. So, bro, she had to go and get, bro, terrible job. She would get like, um warehouse jobs all the mm -hmm. time. She was always working in a warehouse, mm -hmm. always working in like, um, what's the word? 
like um, warehouses and odd jobs, bro. My mama was a hustler. She was always trying to do something to make sure we had something coming in for the house. It was the best with the knowledge that she had, with what she was able to do or mm -hmm. capable to do, she did it at the best of her ability, man. It wasn't um, it wasn't all roses and peaches and cream, but you know, I watched her sacrifice in order to help her boys it was mm -hmm. me and two of my brothers bro she had three boys that she was taking care of on her own mm -hmm. so at one point she got married to my youngest brother's father mm -hmm. but she still ended up getting divorced and having to do it on her own mm -hmm. so me watching her do that bro it, it sort of helped me to see like i don't want to put a woman in this type of situation i don't want to be the type of man that leave my child mm -hmm. with the woman and stress her out like that mm -hmm. yeah how old were you then observing all this from what age to what age bro from like i would say eight mm -hmm. all the way to 18 19 bro really yeah so at what point did you say i i want to just work and help my mom out mm -hmm. i will you know that was um bro i was in the 10th grade mm -hmm. and i wanted to play basketball and um we didn't have the money mm -hmm for us to be able to, for me to be able to get the uniform to play basketball. But my mother was able to get food stamps from the state. You know what food stamps are? Yeah, like for people who can afford to like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so they would give food stamps to my mother and I wanted to play basketball. So I thought, okay, my mm -hmm. mother doesn't have the money, mm -hmm. but we get these food stamps. Mm -hmm. And I know the people at my school love to eat snacks. So what I did was I used some of the food stamp money mm -hmm. in order to buy a bunch of snacks for me to sell in order to make the money mm -hmm. for my uniform. Wow. Yeah, so I always would think of different ways to use what we have in order to get what I needed to get. So mm -hmm. I would say 10th grade, bro, when mm -hmm. I saw the stress of me growing up and her like, you know, continue to having to tell me no and her being upset about telling me no. Mm -hmm. It was like a no because we broke. It wasn't like a no because like, you don't deserve it. It was mm -hmm. like, ah, son, we just don't have the money. So mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I'm tired of asking her, how can I do this on my own? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my father had already showed me how to hustle. He had gave me principles on how to work. So I just had to put it into a way where I could help my family out mm -hmm. and my mother at the time. So 18 years old, you got a job. What job were you doing? At eight, I was, oh man, cutting grass with my father, bro. Mm -hmm. My father, he um started a lawn company in America. He would he had like a small car, bro. And he put a lawnmower in the back of the car and a weed eater. And he, we would drive around mm -hmm. and just ask people, did they need their grass cut? And he taught me through that the principles of working and staying consistent and like continues to show up. So the first job was cutting grass, bro. Wow. Yeah, with my dad, man. And how, how did that, walk me through that point to even whatever, if it was career mm -hmm. to point where getting married and your wife having the epiphany to come into Africa. Like just walk me through that mm -hmm. whole journey. So, um, yeah, my dad taught me how to cut grass and he taught me those principles, bro, at eight, from eight to all the way 18, mm -hmm. when I graduated high school, I mm -hmm. would always have to go do that job with my dad. Like I wanted to play football and foot, American football, mm -hmm. not soccer. The um, one you bump heads. Hey, the other. one bump heads, bro. The crazy game, bro. <laughs> <laughs> bro. I've seen it. That's like very, it's dangerous. Bro, right? it's, bro, it's so crazy that we actually play that game, bro. Mm -hmm. I, I would not, I'm glad my son isn't exposed to it because I would hate for him to want to do it. Bro. Mm. It's that bad. I'm still hurting from injuries that I got at a young age. Bro. Really? Bro, it's, that's a stupid game, bro. Mm -hmm. It's a stupid game. But yeah, that's, that's not the hidden up there right now. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that all yeah. day. But I wanted to play football and my dad always was like, mm -hmm. you got to work. Mm -hmm. Like, I wanted to go work out and get myself training to do that. He was like, no, let's go train and cut grass. I'm like, bro, I want to I wanna work out and play football. But that prepared me because once I graduated from high school, I wasn't able to play football anymore. I had to drop out of college because I didn't get a scholarship. And when I went to college, bro, I was just depressed. Mm -hmm. Like I went to college for my freshman year mm -hmm. and I had this vision of my life that I would be this football star. I was be someone that would be able to play football and take my family to the NFL and we good. And when I got to college, it didn't go out that way. It didn't pan out that way. So I fell into a deep depression, bro. I ended up having to go back home. And when I went back home, bro, 
oddly enough, I reverted back to, I didn't go back and work with my dad, mm-hmm. but I worked with one of my friends. I became an entrepreneur with one of my friends mm-hmm. and I began to do something similar to cut grass. Mm-hmm. I don't, do the leaves fall in Ghana? Like from the trees? Yeah, fall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in fall time, bro, you know, leaves are everywhere. So when I had just dropped out of college, there were leaves on the ground everywhere. So me and my friend, I'm like, bro, look, we can make flyers and we can put them all around these people houses mm-hmm. that need their leaves picked up. So if they need their leaves picked up, me and you can go do it. I had like a small car, just like when my dad started. I had a small car and we went to these people houses, bro, and we started picking up the leaves for these people around our neighborhood and it ended up growing to a point where someone sent me like an hour away mm-hmm. for a big job to go and pick up some leaves for them. So I started my entrepreneur journey after I dropped out of high school. I mean, after I dropped out of college. college yeah. yeah, and um, that began me on my journey, bro. How old were you about that time when you dropped out? Uh, I was about 18, bro. 18, 18. 19, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you started, you became an entrepreneur at that time. I did, but I, I went back into the workforce. I, I ended up becoming a server at a restaurant. No, I started out as a busboy. A busboy? What's bus, a busboy? A busboy is the one who walk around and wipe the tables after the people eat. There's a server oh. who asks you what you want to eat, right. and there's someone who come and clean it clean up. Clean after you've eaten. Yeah, so oh, I so was you the one. started, really? Yeah, that's after I finished doing the leaves, mm-hmm. after the season changed, I had to go and get a job. My parents wanted me to go to a warehouse. They were like, you can get this nice job. You'll get like $15 an hour. They'll treat you good. You'll get benefits. But me, bro, I love people. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be around people. I hated the warehouse environment, bro. Because you'd be alone packing bro, boxes and everything. And I can't talk to people. I can't make people laugh. I can't interact <laughs> with people. I'm like, yeah. I hated it. But my grandmother was like, no, keep it. And mm-hmm. I went against them, bro. I went yeah. against them and I went into a job. I was making 15 an hour mm-hmm. and I went to making like, bro, $5 an hour, bro. Really? But I was so happy. Okay. I learned so much. So yeah, I went back into the workforce and I became a bus boy mm-hmm. and I was wiping tables, bro. And from that, I saw... I was watching the servers mm-hmm. in the restaurants and I'm like, hold on, I can get tips from talking to people and serving them food. I'm always, I've always been a talker and I always mm-hmm. knew this is what I would be doing. So when I started opportunity to become a server, bro, I took advantage of that and start learning that skill set of things. Mm-hmm. And that sort of helped catapult me in a different direction in mm-hmm. a way. I see. So I, I, what age were you about that time? So I was about maybe... 20 bro 20 yeah 20 20 so when would you say life really started for you where you mm-hmm. felt like okay now i have a life i have a job stable job um mm-hmm. this is the the future this this is what i see for my future yeah you know? i would say at 20 at 21 bro i was a uh, um i started getting back closer to god mm. like i was working and i went through that depression stage and i was like okay god my bad let me get back right let me figure out things with you and I ended up becoming, I, was, I joined the church. And when I joined that church, I was so, I was serving so well, bro. I was committed to serving and some, committed in to church. helping the church grow. Yeah. And the pastor actually like asked me to be his arm and bearer, mm-hmm. basically his assistant. Mm-hmm. So I was giving the role of being a pastor's assistant at like 21, bro. And when I got that role, it was like, okay, this is serious. Like, mm-hmm. God, you are really using me. Let mm-hmm. me take advantage of this opportunity and really learn from this. So, bro, I was in Memphis and I was serving as an arm and bearer. I would say for like nine months strong, bro. And I was still a server. Mm-hmm. At this time, I was working at Olive Garden. It's one of the big chain restaurants in, Nas- I mean, in America. Mm-hmm. So I was working there and serving as a, um, a pastor's assistant. Mm-hmm. And the opportunity came for me to be able to, um, well, no, my grandmother moved from Memphis Mm -hmm. three hours away to another city, which was Nashville. So when she moved to Nashville, I went and visited her one time, bro. And when I went and visited her, (laughs) it was a, um, there were some white people out jogging. Hmm. And when they were out jogging, this is how naive I was, bro. Mm -hmm. Um, she spoke to me. The white lady waved at me first. And when she waved at me first, I was like, what? Mm-hmm. These white people are actually friendly. Mm. Like, this, it wasn't like that in my hometown. It was different. So when she spoke to me, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a nice place. Let me see what's going on here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I decided to check it out and ended up, bro, mm-hmm. within like two months, mm-hmm. um, I was going in the same circle in Memphis and things wasn't really 
changing. It was changing within the church, but mm-hmm. I had a group of friends that I wasn't really able to elevate with. Mm-hmm. It was like they continued to pull me down, not intentionally, mm-hmm. but you know how it is when people not thinking yeah. and everybody not on the same page. So mm-hmm. they were sort of like not helping me elevate, bro. And I felt the call for me to leave Memphis mm-hmm. and go to Nashville. Mm-hmm. So I ended up packing everything I had, bro, in my small car at the time. And I left that the comfort of my home time moved three hours away and that is when I feel like life started, bro. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you were independent alone at that time? I, I I'm not gonna lie and say I was independent because yeah. I was I went and slept on my grandmother's couch. Really? Yeah, so Our she age. I was like twenty two. Twenty one yeah. or twenty two at the time, bro. Mm-hmm. I had left Memphis and I was like, Okay, my grandmother in Nashville, mm-hmm. I can just start off on her couch. Mm-hmm. And figure it out from there. Wow. But yeah, I started and I transferred my job from Memphis to Nashville. Mm-hmm. And I was able to stay at her house. And my job was actually like 10 minutes away from our house. Bro. Oh, I see. From the same chain restaurant? Yep, from the same chain restaurant, bro. Right. And that's when life started for you. That's when life really started, bro. Right. That's so at what age did you, I mean, find your wife? Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> Funny question, bro. Yeah. That, <laughs> that month. Mm-hmm. I in the the place that I transferred to, my mm-hmm. wife was working there, bro. I see. So my wife was already a server in the same restaurant that I was going to to work, bro. Wow. So yeah, I got there and I'm like, okay. I wasn't thinking about finding no wife or no girlfriend at the time. I was trying to chill. Mm-hmm. But I ended up running into her, bro, and she was she was so real mm-hmm. and she was something that I had never experienced mm-hmm. and never had encountered before, bro. So mm-hmm. me dealing with her is sort of um it opened my eyes mm-hmm. to a different type of woman. The women that I was dealing with in my hometown was nothing like my wife when I had ran into her. So mm-hmm. initially, I was battling within like, okay, I don't want a girlfriend. I even told her like, I'm not trying to get a girlfriend. But I felt a pull, bro. Mm-hmm. Like I felt like, how can I put it? I felt like a calling to mm-hmm. step up. And mm-hmm. do what I need to do as a man and to put my family in a good position. I haven't even had, a, I didn't even have a family yet, but I felt such a deep connection with her and how real she was that I knew I could build something with her. So we ended up getting together, bro. I moved, I moved to, I moved to um, Nashville in June, mm-hmm. and I probably started that job June fifth. Me and her was dating probably like June twelfth, bro, twelfth mm-hmm. or fifteenth. Mm. I wasn't even thinking. I'm like, nah, I'm not trying to get no girl. And, bro, we just connected, and we've been together ever since, bro. And how old are you now? I'm 30, bro. 30. Yeah. So you found 22 years to 30? Say that again? You found out when you were 22. Yeah, about 22 or 23. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we got married in 2017. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. So what age did she get this epiphany of coming to Africa? What age? Within the marriage. You know, you can't say that. What age was in the marriage or her no, age? No, 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 her age when she had the epiphany. <sighs> I mean, the age she that she had the epiphany. I can't say that. You can't say yeah, it. Yeah, you know you can't say a woman's age, man. You are gonna no, get me in trouble. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not her age. The, what what time? Let me see. What time uh-huh. did she get an epiphany? What? I mean, you you guys are working in the same job. I got you. I got you. I got um, you. How many years into the job? Yeah. You know what was happening? I mean. I, I mean, you. it would connect to where you were looking for the apartment. Yeah. And then it would just now, we just come all the way to Africa and then we start with the Africa stuff. I got you. You get you. what I'm trying yeah, to say? Yeah, I got you. I got you. I got you. Not an age like that. <laughs> right. You're going to get me in trouble, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, boy, um, I feel you. Yeah. So to answer your question, um, mm-hmm. so we were working at the restaurant together, bro. Mm-hmm. And she, um, we quit together at the same time. Mm. So we felt the call to become entrepreneurs. So everything started with my wife making natural products. Mm. So my wife is an herbal practitioner and a student midwife. So she was she started making natural products for hair, mm-hmm. body and skin and for a lot of different people and ailments. So I was like the main spokesperson for everything she mm. made. She literally, bro, practiced every product that she made first. She put it on me first. Mm-hmm. So I was the one who tested everything. I was the one who had to go through it. So I was the one that really stepped up. You and were like the guinea pig. Exactly. That's what I tell everybody. I was the guinea pig, bro. <laughs> so all of them worked. Trust me. Yeah, I was the guinea pig, bro. Yeah. So after I finished the role as a guinea pig, I'm like, you know what? I can help my wife sell these. Mm-hmm. Like, why do I have to go and stress and keep struggling trying to, you know, 
work at this FedEx company mm-hmm. and work at this job where I could really partner with my wife and we can build this company. Mm-hmm. So, bro, I decided to start. I used my gift to take pictures. I started mm-hmm. taking pictures of the products mm-hmm. and I started really like being a spokesperson and a salesman for her products. And that really um, opened our eyes to what we can do mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. So we start. we was doing our business in America, bro. And we were working at a farmer's market. A farmer's market is, you know what it is? Yeah. Yeah, we was working at a farm. You get it like from, from the farm fresh and you sell it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So within our farmer's market, they had different people that make their own products. Mm-hmm. So we was there and I was selling the products for her. Mm-hmm. That was the beginning of our entrepreneurial journey. And we ran into the, not ran into, we, mm-hmm. we had to witness the George Floyd incident. So once we witnessed that and with immediately after she ended up having that dream, we were like, you know what? Mm-hmm. Let's just bring our company, bring what we have to America. I mean, to Africa. Mm-hmm. We don't have to keep dealing with this if mm-hmm. there's other places that we can go. At the time, we were watching. Um, man, I gotta shout my people out, bro. We was watching Kinganda. Mm-hmm. Kinganda showed us a lot of love oh, yeah. on how to do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. an African superstar. Mm-hmm. She was giving us a yeah. lot of game on how to come over here and have the right mindset. Mm-hmm. So it was those two. For sure, for me, bro, mm. that really helped me to see what was possible. But how did they, your family react to you moving <laughs> with your wife and your kids? Bro, they thought I was crazy. Well, did you have a child back then? Yeah, I had one boy, my okay. son at the time. Yeah, yeah. Right now I have two. I have a son and a daughter. But mm-hmm. at the time, it was just my son, man. Mm-hmm. And um, they thought we were crazy. They didn't understand. They didn't get it. But now, oh, man, they respect and understand on a whole nother level. Mm-hmm. But at first, nah, it was I was crazy to mm-hmm. them. And four years into it, how is it living in Tanzania? Because, like, I mean, you saw it in your dream mm-hmm. to come to Tanzania. I mean, your wife did. How's it been? Mm-hmm. You know, has it been challenging? Um, has your life changed? What yeah. has changed within your life? Yeah. What have you learned? Are you the same person? You feel like you're a different person? Yeah, so it definitely has been challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like my life is in a better position. I do not feel like I'm the same person. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I went through some experiences that um, that really seasoned me and helped me to learn a lot and how to deal with people mm-hmm. and specifically our people. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest challenges that I have dealt with is the brainwashing from our people that's coming from America, bro. Mm. Like it's like they they some of them try to fight me to help them. Mm. It's like they're fighting against me and I'm literally trying to help them get comfortable over mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. It it doesn't make sense, but yeah, that's been the biggest challenge that I've been having to deal with is man, unfortunately my people that I'm helping, bro. Mm. Yeah. Why, why 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 is it like that? Because I think I've had more people going through that, you know. I think even what Amaya says is that one thing in Africa that if you want to help help Africans, you'd have to use one hand right fighting the enemies bro. and then white hand fighting your own people bro so like speak to me about that like. man it's it's such a um there's a mentality called crabs in the barrel mentality in mm-hmm. america mm-hmm. and because we've been so brainwashed and conditioned to not trust each other and mm-hmm. hate each other mm-hmm. like people literally will pull you down and try to pull you down if they see you working on something and if they see that if they feel like they are not capable of doing it Like, by us working and being consistent and being focused, Mm -hmm. we shine light on what other people are not doing. Mm -hmm. So, that makes them feel less than. It sort of forces them to feel like, oh, man, Mm -hmm. I should have did this. I could have did this. You should have, you could have. But you don't have to act like this to me. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pull this down. But... A lot of people feel like, you know, they they, they should have did it or they could have did it. So they have guilt within them. So that guilt turns into frustration. Their frustration turns into anger. And their anger turns into envy. And their envy turns into jealousy. Mm. And it's a whole process that if you don't check it in the beginning, you end up getting to that jealous spot. And then that's when things change and they turn into a completely different person. Mm. So I think we've been trained and conditioned to be that way. So if you're not... If they're not intentionally coming over here to heal, intentionally coming over here to check themselves from those type of instances and those spirits that they're feeling, then inevitably they end up mm-hmm. messing things up for mm-hmm. themselves and burn, bro, burn bridges. Mm-hmm. They burn. I know. Man. Yeah, I know. It's a lot. Um, I had yeah. a conversation with a gentleman and he said that he's a, the president of the African-American Association in Ghana mm-hmm. called the Alessandri. And he said something like, when Americans are moving to Africa, they only just, they don't come with their normal luggage. They come with a trauma bag with them. 
Right. And that trauma is so heavy that instead of building bridges with their brothers on the continent, it ended up breaking bridges. Uh, what do you think of that? Bro, I think that's so true. Mm. That's um, such a valid statement. I think what I've learned is when we first get here, bro, mm -hmm. we literally have, we, we can't go into society. Mm. It's like you can, but don't try to connect with people mm -hmm. until you heal. We try to rush and say, oh, I'm in Africa. It's time to go and heal. And, I mean, not heal, but it's time to go and connect with my brothers. It's mm -hmm. time to go and build. But we don't even know how to do that yet. We don't know how to be a village. We don't know how to be a tribe. We don't know how to be a group of people because we haven't seen it in so long. Our, you guys have seen it over here on the mm -hmm. continent, mm -hmm. but us in America, our families have been strategically ripped apart. Our communities have been strategically ripped apart. So we don't even know how to be a group of people right now. Mm. So I feel like that's a true statement. And in order to counter that, bro, when you get here, when our African-American brothers and sisters get here, it's important that we take a season to just stay in our home mm. and deal with our family issues, deal with the healing that we have to deal with before we come into society and hurt the same people that we want to build with. Mm. A lot of people end up, man, hurting themselves so bad just because they're not in the healed state mentally. I've had people come back, mm -hmm. bro, they, they'll, they'll do something to me in month two of them being here mm. but at month 15 they come back and apologize because they're like brother oh man my mental state wasn't right at the time i wasn't even ready yet they realize it later so now i'm seeing like no we need to stay at home first don't come out here and jump into the culture don't come out here and try to connect with your brothers and sisters no stay at home deal with your wife issues deal with your mother issues deal with your father issues deal with your family issues before you go into the society and mess yourself mm, up. Mm, yeah. I like that. We need to have a spiritual retreat first before. <laughs> <laughs> a long retreat. <laughs> um, but I always look at a positive side. Um, mm -hmm. I really believe that things are going to change. Yeah, man. You know, with time. What would you say would be some things you wish you knew before you embarked on the journey to Tanzania? Mm. Mm -hmm. What do I wish I knew before I embarked on the journey to mm -hmm. Tanzania? Mm -hmm. I wish I knew the the level of brokenness that we're dealing with as a people. Because when I first came, I was very naive and wide open, bro. Like, I'm talking about wide open. I thought if you was black, we was cool. Like, if, if you say uh, shalom, if you say <laughs> welcome back to Africa, if you say let's build my African-American brother, I'm running with you. But now... I learned like you got to look at that person work, look at what they've been doing, look at what they built, look at what they working on, look at their mm -hmm. mindset. So many different things that we have to look at before we decide to move forward. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have knew that all skin folk, not kin folk. Mm. Like, I didn't really understand that. Mm. I came with this naivety, naive mindset that everybody that's here supposed to be building. Mm -hmm. We all supposed to be working together. So I had mm -hmm. to learn how low how people will go mm -hmm. and how messed up our people are man mm -hmm. yeah. if you have like a, a a message or advice for people considering relocating what would that advice be um that advice would be focus on you and your family mm -hmm. it sounds selfish but that's the best way for you to be able to help the world like so many of us as black people we want to be the tugboat we want to pull everybody but we can't be the tug, but we have to be the lighthouse. We have to be the example. We have to heal our families first. We have to heal ourselves first. And then when we get to that healed state, we are able to shine our light. And if people come and they want to see that, mm -hmm. be an example so they can pick up the principles and do it for themselves. But we don't have to pull everybody and like mm -hmm. waste our energy trying to force people to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, focus on yourself, focus on healing. Mm -hmm. We all coming from 400 years of trauma. It's not gonna be kumbaya. We in Africa. Let's let's. It's it's all done. No, you gotta strategically sit down, strategically heal, strategically pray against what you've been mm -hmm. forcing and fighting within, and call all those things out, bro. Mm -hmm. That would be the main thing. I would say heal. Mm -hmm. Focus on healing. Don't mm -hmm. try to link with everybody before you heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have a final message, what would that message be? If I had a final message, the final message would be. Hmm. We 
we can't afford to still be fearful. Hmm. We can't afford to be um there's this 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 fear of the white boogeyman mm. that we as what people deal way? with. The white boogeyman, you know. Mm -hmm. There's been things that happen in history to a mm -hmm. lot of our leaders and a lot of our people from white crazy people. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our people are crippled mm -hmm. by moving on their instincts and moving on their calling because they feel like the white man gonna come get them. Mm. Like I'm sure with you, when you started this platform, when mm -hmm. you started to talk about it, you had those thoughts like, man, what if they come kill me? Mm -hmm. What if they try to come take me mm -hmm. out for doing this work? <laughs> so a lot of people watching this mm -hmm. don't want to come to Africa because they feel like, oh, man, the white people going to come hurt me. They're going to come get me. And that's what stops us and what's keeping us from going to where we need to go. It's that fear of being scared of them, bro. We don't have to be scared of them. We can stand in our power, stand in what we're supposed to be doing and be bold. And once they see you bold... Mm -hmm. They respect that. Mm -hmm. If they feel like you stupid, they're going to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. So if you stand up for yourself, we'll be good. So I would say let go of the fear of the boogeyman. Mm -hmm. Like, it's real. History happened. Yeah, we got hurt. Yeah, some people were murdered. But if you stand up on top of those people's shoulders who were murdered and stand strong for them, bro, they can't kill all of us. Mm -hmm. We got to keep working and stay strong. So that would be the myth. I like that. Now, I know we are almost at the end of the conversation. But would you say you had any preconceived notion about Africa, apart from the um, running around zebras? And all that, apart from that, do you have any preconceived notion before coming down here? Um, believe it or not, um, because of King Ganda mm -hmm. and what he was producing, he's changed my preconceived notions to what was possible. Mm. I saw him hustling in Uganda, bro. I remember vividly. He was on live mm -hmm. walking through Uganda. With, the streets. Yeah, with the African background of black people walking by looking. And he was talking about the business he was doing and how he was building. And I was like, it's doable. Mm. It's possible. So my preconceived notion before I came was I can come over here and build something for my family. Mm. Yeah, I had after I did the independent research and started looking at the different YouTubers who were already here doing mm. the work, mm -hmm. they helped me to gain the confidence to see, okay, you can do this over here too, mm. man. Mm. So shout out to Kinganda, bro. I yeah, appreciate and, you, man. And bro, like we should get a time to work together, man. Like invite me out and you know, <laughs> let's just make it work because yeah. he's cre he's created a beautiful platform. Yeah, man, almost yeah. similar to what I have. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard, I mean, his YouTube numbers are crazy. Yeah, bro, he's he's doing numbers. He got a good system in place. But he's yeah. doing something right, bro. I yeah. need to I need to come to you and study your whole system. <laughs> but um, shout out to you. Yeah, um, do you have some success stories you've heard? You know, fellow African Americans coming down here to Africa and actually making it. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to mention the person's name. Yeah, but let's just put some numbers out there to inspire some folks because I've had people reach out and like, oh what you, you guys think you have here calling freedom is not what a freedom is mm. we are happy in new york living in a condo apartment mm. working nine to five people really think that that is the ultimate you mm. know what i'm saying wow. rather than the possibilities i mean you are into real estate which we will dive into that you yeah. know briefly um if you do have some success story to share to mm. inspire people to to make them know that look it's possible yeah i can even tell you numbers from like i'm here in tanzania and i interviewed also an entrepreneur called max maxwell and he came to the Tanzania over three, three, three years, four years now, and mm -hmm. has built real estate, mm -hmm. sold tens, bro, 10 million plus in his first project. This second project is going to be $33 million. Wow. Right? In a period of four years. So I'm telling you this numbers. Yeah. I mean, he's an African American. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. He had a liquidity. He had, he wanted to take the risk, right? And mm. there's the arrow eyes. So share with me some you know good stories you've heard people you know mm -hmm. um success you know mm -hmm. i think it comes with challenges so oh, we're yeah. not focusing on the challenges yeah, right now yeah. let's talk about the good stories yeah. you've heard so far okay mm -hmm. well just briefly on max maxwell you just mentioned bro yeah he was one of the first people who actually inspired me to begin real estate so it's, it's a full circle moment that we are actually in the same country. I'm actually looking forward to meeting him one day so we can sit down and have a discussion about things and how he helped me. But yeah, that brother, bro, he, he really made something happen with taking the risk. So he's someone that people should definitely look into and see what he has going on because he's very inspirational with what he's been able to build. But success stories I've been able to witness... I've seen people come over here, bro, and they've opened up successful restaurants. Mm -hmm. Like people have... You know, us, we have a gift of cooking. We know how to cook some good food. 
So I've seen a few people come over here and they've opened up restaurants and they've been over here for at least three three years mm-hmm. plus and mm-hmm. they've been doing it successfully. Mm-hmm. I've seen people open up um, juice stands, juice restaurants. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a system here called Wakala. Mm-hmm. It's like basically a money exchange place. Mm-hmm. Like people can bring their Tanzanian shillings and put it in directly onto their phones and things like that and send it throughout mm-hmm. the country. Mm-hmm. And I've seen Americans come over and open up successful businesses with that. Mm-hmm. I've seen successful um, uh, laundry mat. Someone opened up a laundry mat mm-hmm. that's doing pretty well over here. Mm-hmm. And of course, I've seen people use their stories to create content. You can't go wrong with that. If you got a pure heart, and if you're serious about this, you can di- definitely document your journey mm-hmm. and use that as leverage in order to have mm-hmm. success over here. Mm-hmm. So I've seen a lot of people do that. Mm-hmm. And what's another one? I've seen people come over here and like buy cars mm-hmm. and rent them out mm-hmm. and make money that way with, with making strategic partnerships with different people within the country so that they can drive their cars. I've seen elder people come over here and invest in people mm-hmm. with, that are locals and help them elevate and they make money together. So I've seen a, a lot of different success stories, but it, it takes a different mindset mm-hmm. to be able to do it successfully. You got to tap into a different mindset and have some patience and endure a lot of the craziness mm-hmm. in order to enjoy the success of being over here. I like that. Now, I mean, you did mention about creating content. Mm-hmm. How do you start with content creation? Because like you have a big platform, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I started with, um, believe it or not, in when I dropped out of high school, mm-hmm. I mean, college, I didn't drop out of high school. I dropped out of college. college yeah. <laughs> when I dropped out of college, bro, in 2012, I always knew I would have my own show, bro. Mm. But you know, in 2012, it wasn't content. We wasn't walking around with our phones. So I've always had this pull to do content. I've always had this calling to do it. And I got started because I'm going to go back to my wife, bro. Mm -hmm. Um, My wife, I was, when we got married, I was focused on creating a show. I was like, I need to have my own show. I know I have my own show. What is my show going to be about? I was just brainstorming and focused. And my wife ended up having my son. Mm. And when she had my son, bro, um, she gave, one day she gave him a popsicle. Mm. I think he was like three months, maybe three or four months. Mm -hmm. And she gave him that popsicle and he acted crazy. He was like trying to like take it from her. Mm -hmm. And so she told me like, I was still doing my small motivational videos. I was trying to inspire people and just post like 10 seconds of me saying quotes and posting quotes and things. But At this moment, um, she said, you should record our son as you give him a popsicle. So, bro, I gave this man a popsicle and he literally tried to jump out of my arms and like snatch the popsicle from me. Mm -hmm. And it went viral all around the world, bro. Mm -hmm. So when that video went viral, that was my moment to say, "Okay, this is my show. My show is going to be about me and my son, Mm -hmm. about what we're doing and Mm -hmm. how I'm trying to do this fatherhood thing. So I started creating content around that. Mm. And as we came to Africa, it sort of transitioned into me doing content about Africa. Mm. So I always knew I would be doing content. I would have my own show, but it just took a journey with me getting married Mm -hmm. and my wife helping birth Mm. what I would be doing. Mm. Yeah. So she literally birthed my son and literally my son birthed the content that we were supposed to be doing so it was like we all work together in order to get to where we at now i like that and content creation is the future bro <laughs> yes yeah yeah you want to speak about it bro um i believe in it so much it's crazy man it's, mm-hmm. it's um the best way for us to get out of the situation that we in as mm-hmm. a people is to build our own personal brand through content mm-hmm. Like the internet is wide open right now and there's nothing but space and opportunity. And if you can confidently pick your phone up and start speaking on camera, you can build something. Everybody is watching me mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. This is all I use, bro. iPhone. iPhone. So I've been able to create 85,000 followers on Instagram mm-hmm. and about 40, 42, I think on YouTube right now, mm-hmm. 42 or 43,000. Off my iPhone, iPhone, bro. Mm. Just being consistent, showing up, and being myself. Mm. So I know content is the future. I believe in it like, bro, Mm -hmm. like my next breath almost, Mm -hmm. man. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I I really believe in it. It's powerful because, like, if you think about it, back in the days before you can even get on TV, it's like a huge deal, right? 
right you go on tv because people are watching tv you have the attention of the people yeah right and you have to go through like so many different channels paying a hefty amount of money to get in front of people but now you have it in your pocket bro your pocket you no excuse i'm like a, a full stadium is like thirty thousand people yeah maximum fifty thousand yeah you have forty thousand subscribers yeah. that's a full stadium of fans and, and lovers and subscribers watching you and you have all in your pocket mm -hmm. you can access them anytime mm -hmm. right yeah. so Bro, it's a no-brainer. You know, I, bro, I, I always talk about this. Content education is the future. I'm, I literally have an event in Ghana in December 20th mm. where I'm going to teach people about how powerful content education is mm. and being an influencer. It's mm. a future, bro. bro. If you become an influencer now, from now to the next five to ten years, I'm telling you, bro. bro. I'm telling you. Yes. It's like, a window of opportunity. I'm Small. telling you. And I, I've met business owners who are utilizing social media and making millions. Millions. Millions, bro. Wow. On the continent. Yeah. Wow. Let me bro, meet them, bro. I'm telling you. <laughs> like, I can't really tell you more details, but don't see yourself as a, as a YouTuber. See yourself as you having an advertisement platform yeah. where you put your business out there to promote whatever you have going on. Yeah. Right. And then you're not just... Your jurisdiction is not where you live alone. It's the whole world. Mm hmm Right, so yep. your potential investors, potential clients doesn't just come from the country you live in, it comes from the whole world. Yep. So if you would sell, like, example, 100, now you sell 100,000 mm -hmm. because you're not limited. Yep. And that's how powerful content creation, you know, being an influencer is. But, you know, would you say it has been, you know, from your own story, what would you say it has contributed to your growth or even your success in terms of businesses? And then we'll dive into real estate and how you started. I would say what contributed to my success is honestly man my father my mm -hmm. father and my mother in a way mm -hmm. like even though it wasn't the ideal upbringing i still learned a lot of principles like because from my father me watching him as an entrepreneur so my dad he unfortunately went to prison mm -hmm. when i was like eight seven or eight years old and when he got out of prison he couldn't get a job so they wouldn't hire him because when in America, if you go to jail and you get a felony, they don't allow you to go get a job in certain areas or certain places. So you have to get like terrible jobs. So instead of him like complaining and like, you know, begging for a job, man, this man, like I said, he got his small car, put the lawnmower in the car, brought his three boys with him. And we started cutting grass around the city. And I watched this man start cutting grass and he ended up. Bro, he ended up literally cutting grass. He got contracts with the city now. Hmm. The city pays him hmm. to go and cut grass at the Capitol buildings and certain buildings within the city. Apartment complexes. He have contracts mm -hmm. to cut grass there now. So me watching him hustle and not have to ask them for anything, it always gave me the mindset that I'm a boss. Like, I don't have to ask nobody for nothing. I can create something on my own. If I see my dad do it, I can do it too. Hmm. So that was the main thing that I saw growing up that really gave me the push that I can be an entrepreneur. Hmm. Yeah, even when I was in high school, I, w I used to host talent shows, bro. When I was in the um, 10th grade, my teacher gave me the ability, the opportunity to host a talent show. Mm -hmm. And I hosted the talent show from 10th grade all the way to my 12th grade year. And I had a confidence at that time. Like I told my teacher when I graduated, I'm going to have my own show one day. Mm -hmm. I was in high school like, hey, one day I'm going to have my own show. There was this show called 106 in Park. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with 106 in Park? No. It's a show. It was a show on BET mm -hmm. where they used to show videos and there was, used to be a host. At one point, it was a little Bow Wow and different people that they would have hosted and introduced mm -hmm. videos and artists. Mm -hmm. Bro, I tried out for that show at like 18 years old, bro. Right out of high school, like fresh off the football field, I did a video applying for something like that. Mm. So I always had this inkling that, now nah, I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to mm -hmm. have my own show mm -hmm. one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just stayed with that, bro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. How, how did real estate start for you, though? So real estate started because, um, real estate started because I was broke. Mm. And... I was watching um, Max Maxwell, bro, mm -hmm. and I saw what he was able to do as a black man without using any money. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, he, he was teaching us how we can just position ourselves to get the money from the rich people mm -hmm. and help them put it in the right place. It's basically what he was teaching us. So I'm watching his content. I'm like, hold on. So I don't have to have a lot of capital to get into real estate. 
I don't have to have all this money to buy things to get into it. I can just use my personality to mm-hmm. connect with people and help them get land and get a percentage or help them sell their house and get a percentage. So once I learned about that opportunity and how I can get an asset, which is land, mm-hmm. from doing it, I decided to take it on, bro, and see what I can get from it. Hmm. Yeah. How many years have you been doing that now? Right now, it's been four years, bro. Mm-hmm. It's been four years, and I've been able to do it more so successfully over here. Mm-hmm. Over when I was over in America, I was beginning it. I was um, mm-hmm. well, I was getting my feet wet. I was networking and talking to different people and going into those rooms as the broke man, mm-hmm. trying to just get the information and get the knowledge. But now since I've been here on the continent, bro, mm-hmm. I've been able to get, help people get beach plots. Mm-hmm. We've been able to develop a whole 78 acre community, bro, with a lot of different Americans that's thinking about coming here. Mm-hmm. I've been able to help all of them get land the legal way mm-hmm. over here in Tanzania, mm-hmm. bro. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell me more about the land acquisition here. I mean, because in Ghana, I know it's different. Like, it's crazy. Um, you might have all the documents, but it's still not yours. Man. How is it different? Is it different here in Tanzania? Yeah, in terms of that, I know for sure here, you know, as as quote-unquote foreigners, we aren't allowed to own land. Mm. So, you know, you have to be a part of a business or um, have your land in a business name in order to legally own it here. Mm. So, you know, some people get off the plane and think, oh, I just want to buy land. How can I do that? It's like, no, bro. You got to get a part of a business and within that business, you need to have a Tanzanian as a majority shareholder and you need to make sure that all your paperwork is in order and your business is legit and your permits is legit Mm -hmm. and everything so that you can have that land. So it's a it's not just a cut and dry process, bro, but it's doable if you have the right team in place. Like I'm blessed very blessed and fortunate to have a good lawyer bro that really helped us and walked us through the process and made sure that we were doing everything properly Mm -hmm. so it's a it's a it's a strenuous process but you got to make sure i would recommend just having a lawyer or Mm -hmm. someone legal on your team Mm -hmm. to help that process go Mm -hmm. smoother for Mm -hmm. you don't really just take it's okay to take people word for it that's done it but always have a lawyer on your team to make sure that this is legit. Mm-hmm. They can go and check on things for you and they can make sure that this is the way that it's supposed to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. I mean, if you do have like three business ideas for people watching this right now, mm-hmm. people want to come invest um, um, on the continent, what would that you know, business advice be? Invest on the continent. I would say, man, Invest in someone creating content. Mm-hmm. You can invest in Web Nation. <laughs> you can invest in T3 and Me yeah. and Tim Ford Jr. Mm-hmm. Or you can invest in several different assets. One thing I'm noticing is these machines, bro. Excavator machines, cranes, construction equipment. Bro, you get one of those. Bro, that's creating wealth for a long mm-hmm. time, bro. Just put some money in the machine. Of course, you can't go wrong with acquiring land and putting buildings on that land in order to get apartments or you can do businesses on that land. Mm-hmm. So you can't go wrong with that. And another one is, what's the word? Um, so I'm tip my tongue. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Like products, products products and material. Like let's say a company need bulk things. Mm -hmm. You can have that bulk option for people in order to have your, you have, in order for you to have a Mm -hmm. cash flow Mm -hmm. of money coming in. So if people need something, they can actually come to you. Mm -hmm. And of course, last but not least, you can never go wrong with agriculture, bro. Farming. Go to farming. You can't go wrong. Find a farm, invest in a farm and put your money into a farm and watch it grow because man the world always needs to eat so if you put your money where the food where they're gonna be coming to get food from bro you're gonna win mm-hmm. yeah they eat every day exactly every mm. day what do you think are the three things americans diasporans people in, in general moving to africa shouldn't bring along with them? shouldn't yeah hmm what are three things people shouldn't bring with them i would say um number one you have to lose the mindset that our African brothers and sisters hate us. Hmm. Like we were taught that you guys hate us and don't want to build with us and don't want to be connected with us. So there's Hmm. like this hesitancy to connect and hesitancy to really trust and interact with each other. So we have to lose that mindset that we were taught that, bro, they don't trust you. They gonna, they sold you into slavery. They really going to try to send you back. Hmm. So we have to lose that mindset for one, two, you have to stay away from negative people. They'll literally like 
pull you down unintentionally. Mm. Like you come over here and there's some Americans who see it, they get it. They mm. want to chill, they want to figure it out and get acclimated. But then there's some who, oh, the service is terrible. Oh, the food is not good. Oh, the people don't know how to do this. Mm. Oh, the people don't do business well. Like those type of people that complain about every single thing, steer clear away from them mm. so that you can mm -hmm. figure things out and stay on your journey. Mm. And lastly, hmm. Ask me for three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. It could be something physical. A lot of um, I've had I had a conversation with a lady who shipped almost her whole house mm. in a container a and realized she didn't really need it. That's a good one. That's a good um, one. That could be something that people shouldn't bring to yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, bro, because you, you, you get everything here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You probably just spend extra more taking it out of the port. Yeah. And that's you can true. literally just buy it right here, Man, cheaper, that's true. better, that's a good one. high quality. That's a good one. That's yeah. a great one. Actually. I'll take that one. That's a good yeah. one. Don't ship your whole house. You mm -hmm. do not have to ship your whole house, man. Mm -hmm. I've seen people have horror stories mm -hmm. dealing with the ports, man. Um, when they see your containers full of American things, that's a green light for some of them to try to take advantage and really um, make your process a lot harder than they have to be. And literally everything you want to bring, it's over here already. You can go to the mall and purchase it. You can go to a market and purchase it on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, things are here, especially in East Africa. I don't know, you know, I'm not too familiar with other countries. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's pretty well in Ghana, but mm -hmm. I can only speak for Tanzania. And mm -hmm. I know like you don't have to bring all that extra baggage that you have, that you choose to bring. Cause mm -hmm. um, my wife and I, bro, we sold everything. We only came with, I want to say, Four, four or five suitcases, man, and eight thousand USD, bro. Mm -hmm. That's it. What? That's it, bro. No <laughs> furniture, just eight thousand, bro. Our first two months, my wife and I literally slept on the floor, bro. On the floor. On the floor, bro. For two months, and it was, it wasn't bad. Yeah. It wasn't bad, bro. It's paying off. It's worth <laughs> it. But yeah, bro, we was on the floor, so you don't have to, you don't have to stress and bring all this stuff, mm -hmm. man. Just have your faith. And have the mindset, mm -hmm. and it'll all come together. Man. Mm. Yeah. Now, someone said something that I think is true to some extent that if you don't have the right mindset or you don't change your mindset, you would never make it in Africa. Right. So you think you run into paradise, you run into get a chance, <laughs> an opportunity to turn things around, and you don't change your mindset, you're better off in America. Bro, what, do you, what do you say to that? Bro, there's this mindset that, you know, um, there's this privilege that people come with from America. Mm. They think because we're American that they're supposed to roll out the red carpet. I know Ghana did it in a way with the year of return. So it's sort of like expected, bro. It's expected, but it still come with a level of work. You can, they can roll out the red carpet, but you still have to show why you walking on the red carpet, show why you deserve to be on the red carpet. What type of work can you do? What type of, mindset do you have in order to withstand being on that red carpet because if you don't think properly you're gonna get yourself off the red carpet and they're not handing they're not doing handouts you saw the gun of your return they did that because someone worked for a long time in order for them to say hey Ghana open up the door for my people so that they can come this way somebody worked for that so just because a country is like hey come on welcome you still have to develop the mindset of a producer from America, coming from America, a lot of us have the mindset of consumers. We've been trained to consume. We've been trained to really take, 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 but you have to come here with the producer mindset in order to fully understand and take advantage of what's possible over mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Producer, bro, you gotta shift your mindset to a producer. Mm. Because I, I don't know, but I mean, I can still count few Americans who are investing, right? Mm. Being producers than consuming, mm. you know? But on the other hand, it's like Chinese. Have you seen Chinese coming here to look for work? Bro, that don't, that's not even a question. Work. Right, like, what, you what? know, yeah. What's that? And, and Max was saying that he know people who just came with nothing. They're like construction workers in the UK, mm. like in, the, in Europe. They are like average. Chinese? Bottom, no, yeah, uh -huh. no, no. Europeans. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Caucasians, mm -hmm. right? People who don't look like us. Mm -hmm. They're like the minimum wage in their country. They come here, be entrepreneurs, and they become millionaires. Millionaires, bro. Yes, I've seen that. I've, I've heard stories about Chinese, bro, mm -hmm. coming, going to different markets with a backpack, 
And becoming a millionaire. Backpacking yeah. an iPhone. They wear the same shirt every day. Bro. <laughs> Faithfully, yeah. Faithfully, change it for what? Change it when they get rich. Yeah, they got a different mindset, bro. I can't mm-hmm. say that. They they see the opportunity and they stick together, and they get it done. What do you think we can learn from them? I think we can learn how to mind our business. Mm. How to mind our business and build with our people. Like we don't know the Chinese business. We don't know what they got going on, but we see them working. So we need to develop minding our own business and focus on working, man. Like, stop worrying about all the other mess. Like drama. we, Yeah, bro. Why do we love drama so much? We've been trained that way. Hmm. We've been trained, bro. We've literally been trained to love drama. Like, I learned it coming here from me healing and me sitting down and really dealing with myself. Like, we literally gravitate towards the negativity because we've been fed it so much for a long time we need it we need a dose of negativity some people Hmm. like some people don't even have a good day unless they talk about some gossip or have some mess come up they need it in order to like and they're like yeah yeah bro yeah i'm having a good day now oh this is a mess (laughs) like they love it bro so reality (laughs) tv and the society that we were brought up in forced us to really be that type of people Mm. bro yeah Mm. What what helped your healing though? What did mm. you do in your healing process? Mm. What helped my healing? Mm. Uh, back my wife mm. and accountability, bro. Accountability, like I'm I'm a very big self critic. I'm hard on myself, bro, because I know better and I know what it takes to get to where I want to go. So I knew, like my whole thing with getting married was so that I could not end up in a situation that I seen my family in. Mm. So. I get married knowing, like, I'll never cheat on this woman. I'm going to be focused. I'm going to be married. And I'm with her for the rest of my life. Mm. So me having that mindset, bro, it holds me accountable into that standard all the time. Mm. Like, I, I have people around me that hold me to that standard, too. I have this mindset of where, like, I have to figure it out so my children don't have to deal with what I dealt with. They don't have to be in the situation that I was in. Like, long as I get myself together for them, I'm good. So I'm I'm really, really, really all about healing myself and dealing with what we've been mm-hmm. put through. Because I've seen the hurt from my family and what I've experienced. Mm-hmm. I know that's not a good feeling. I don't want to put that on nobody else or pass that down again. So mm-hmm. if I fall, if I my son see me make a mistake, I make a mistake with my wife, I got to clean it up, mm-hmm. fix that. Because my mindset is healing. Mm-hmm. My mindset is breaking generational curses. So I don't pass this down to my children, bro. I like that. Yeah. When your parents look at you, what do they say to you? <laughs> That's a good question. My dad, yeah. my, well, they proud of me now, man. I've been getting a lot of I'm proud of you messages. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's hard for fathers to say that. So my dad would, like, tag me in certain things on Instagram and, like, say my name. Or my mom would, like, make Facebook posts. But they're very, very proud, bro. They're, they they see that their son stuck with his guns. I went against, you know, what a lot of people was telling me to do mm-hmm. my dad always bragged now he was like man you always said you had your own show mm-hmm. and you always told me you was gonna do that and now that i'm doing it it's mm-hmm. like yeah he see me he understands mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. yeah my parents are very proud bro mm-hmm. i wish they can i wish they make it over here one day. i hope yeah. they can yeah how did how did they say to it coming to africa what how did they, yeah what did they say to so it? uh my mom she's interested mm-hmm. but my father he he's interested but he can't because of like there's a thing called child support in america Mm -hmm. so child support is basically where they the state make you pay them in order for them to pay the mother for the Mm -hmm. child Mm -hmm. so since my mother and father wasn't married the state put my father on child support so that he could pay them so Mm -hmm. they could pay my mother Mm -hmm. so he wasn't paying them, mm-hmm. but the state was paying my mother. Mm-hmm. So now he owes a lot of money for mm-hmm. what the state gave to my mother. So he has back pay. So he owed them like a few th- hundreds, I think like maybe a few tens of thousands of dollars mm-hmm. because of me and my brother. Mm-hmm. And they don't allow the people to get passports who owe back pay on child support. Really? Yes, bro. So you can't even get a passport. What? Yeah. Bro, it's crazy, right? It's crazy. Yeah, so he can't get a passport and come over here. So he would love to, but Mm -hmm. he just can't. And my mother, she would love to, too. She's just trying to get the money in place. And hopefully one day I'm able to build something where Mm -hmm. I can get her over here Mm -hmm. and be able to take care of her. My dad, too. You know, hopefully we can get the money where 
you know, child support is like, ah. Let's say they're watching man. the video right now. Mm-hmm. Make sure they see you sitting in, having a chat with me. What would you say to them? Ah, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. What would I say to them? I'm doing it, y'all. I made it, man. I, um, you know, I trusted the process. I trusted the journey. And I, I took what you guys went through. And I took what you guys taught me from me sitting with you guys and learning from you guys. And I took it and ran with it. Um, you know, the work that y'all did, the sacrifice that y'all went through, the, um, the tears that y'all shared, and the work that y'all done was not in vain. Um, I learned a lot. I know you guys didn't, you know, vocalize it, but I watched and I learned a lot. I learned a lot from y'all mistakes and I learned what to do in order to help this family move forward. So, you know, I know we're healing and we have some things that we have to face within ourselves, mama, daddy, you know, you have to do some things that you have to heal on. But, you know, I've created a foundation for you guys to be able to come over here comfortably and retire and not have to stress about you know the things that we've been having to stress about as a family for all these years yeah and one to your friends watching you my friends that's oh, funny you said that bro my i got fr- i've been trying to put my friends bro you see i'm building this platform mm-hmm. and i have opportunities within the brand now in order to put a lot of my friends in a good position in order to us to build something a bit, yeah, yeah. And two of my good friends that I've extended the olive branch to, they told me, bro, I can't see myself. Basically, in a nutshell, I can't see myself working for you. Hmm. It, they it, said that. They said it. It wasn't in a disrespectful manner. Let me just, let me clean it up. It hmm. wasn't like, they like, no, I can't work for you, bro. Like, what that look like? It was like, there was a ego involved. Like, man, I can't come and sit under you mm-hmm. if I can build something on my own. If I could do this on my own, why Is he would doing I sit on his own right now? They're not. But they're working for a white man. Exactly. And they're okay with it. Exactly. They're not but, okay with it, but they're doing it. No, they're still doing it. Yeah. It's, it's we we are sick. We need to go to the hospital. Bro, here, bro, we yeah. need, bro, we need healing, man. Bro, healing, bro. We need healing. Yeah. Um. It's a lot, guys. If you're watching this and you're enjoying it. Listen, this has been a great conversation, I'll tell you that. Thank you, bro. Um, Thank listen, you. these are people on ground. He's been here for four years. You want to move to Tanzania. He's the one you should contact, right? Four years is a lot of experience. He, yeah. he went from literally sleeping with his wife on the floor mm. to, you know, building a, a successful business, you know, doing great on, on social media. And, I mean, the process still continues, but mm. he's not where he was when he started. Right, and these are advices that he can give you for free. Try yeah. to mentor you through it. Yeah. Don't be too ignorant. Or don't be too arrogant. Too much ego that you, you you're too big to learn from people. Yeah. Because trust me, you learn for your you, you learn for yourself, but you go through the hard route. Some people don't make it out. You know what I'm saying? Like it's true. So it's true. The easiest way, the shortcut to success is having a mentor, having someone to you know coach you through it. And he's here on the ground. Don't you, listen. Forget about the people whatever they say it online right yeah when you see the real you see the real right so reach out feel free uh, link in the description connect and uh yeah if you have any my final message before we sign off yeah. if you don't um yeah this has been a great conversation yeah man. man have i got one final message mm-hmm. i want to clean up what i said about my friends mm-hmm. and teach people something from that mm-hmm. my brothers said to me like they can't see themselves working for me mm-hmm. And I understood where they were coming from because mm-hmm. of what we've been taught. But I, I use the example of LeBron James, bro. You saw what LeBron was able to do? Mm-hmm. Bro, Le- LeBron played high school basketball, of course. Mm-hmm. And his high school team wasn't able to make it to the level that he was able to. But they were his friends. Every one of his friends has a position in his brand. And they have made themselves a successful millionaire because they were connected with LeBron as he was building his thing. So he's built his brand to like a, what it is now, but his agent was his point guard in high school. Hmm. And he he created a media company with somebody else who was else. I forget which other position, but I think he was a shooting guard or somebody, another person that was on the basketball team. He has a media company with them. So he has companies with his teammates and he was able to build something with his people. So, I'm really focused on trying to build something with our people. It's, 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 it's better when you do it with your people, man. Mm-hmm. Don't try to force it. 
it's easier if you do it with someone you was in the mud with and hustling with and struggling with. It makes the success a lot better. So my last final thing I would say to the people out there is lock arms with the right people. Connect with the right people. Build with the right people. It's time for us to let go of the wrong mindset, let go of the negativity, let go of not believing in one another. If one person have a vision, support that vision for a season and watch what God do for you later. Like sometimes in a season, you have to sacrifice and serve someone. It's a biblical principle. You have to serve first in order for God to reward you in your things. So you have to be okay with Taking the back seat sometimes. Everybody not gonna be in the front. Everybody not can't be the star of the show. Sometimes you gotta be in the back. Sometimes you gotta be the one sending the email. Sometimes you gotta be the one clearing the way at security. You have to do that in order to push things forward. So lock arms with the right people and don't be afraid to build. Stand your lane, use your gift, and God will open doors for you on your team. Mm. Yeah. I love it. Um, invest in Africa now before it's too late. Zanzibar is beautiful, guys. Yeah. Is it turquoise yeah. water, whatever they call it? Turquoise, yeah, yeah, turquoise. It's see true, guys. <laughs> I can literally see the, the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful, right? White sand beach and everything. I spoke to Max, and this is when I tell you some things like this, you, you need to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Max is a multi multi millionaire, right? He has invested oh, how, 10 millions of dollars. You understand this? And he's telling me that if you don't buy property, or you don't buy land right now in Zanzibar, in the next five years, it's going to be very hard for you to buy it, right? Mm. And even if you can buy it, it's going to be very expensive. Yeah. You understand? Ten years, forget about it. Yeah. So if you're really in a position where you think you can invest in Africa, right, the time is now. Yeah, the time is now. Bro, Diallo Sambra is the president of African American Association in Ghana. He said, if you're making over $100,000, $150,000 in America, you are wasting your time living in the Man. USA right now. One fifty over here? Think about it. Bro. bro. Bro, you can buy like an acre of land here in Zanzibar and start building something nice like an Airbnb, bro. Man, and still have a lot of money left. Left, bro. Man, yeah. Because other ethnicities are doing it, bro. Running full speed, too. Right? Yeah. And they move in silence, so you know, mm -hmm. you know. They are not, they're not like us who have a podcast talking about our investment strategy. But they don't do that. They just move in silence. Yeah. And we do this just to help our brands because I, I feel like I don't want you guys to miss out, man. Because in Africa is going to be closed, soon. bro, bro. <laughs> Anyways, let me just not get into it. Yeah. Uh, if you like the video, like, share, and subscribe. Comment down below. Let's get engagement going. Um, Check out me, you know, my page on Instagram, Captain underscore Hey for it, and also go check out his social and everything. If you want to contact him, his uh, contact information is in the description. Yes. And yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for talking to me, man. You're I welcome, appreciate brother. it. Thank you for having me. All man. right, I appreciate yeah. it. And one right. thing, thing he mentioned, man, mm -hmm. I do coach people as well. If you want to figure out how you can come over here by yourself and figure this thing out for you and your family, I offer consultations where I will sit on the phone with you for one hour and answer all the questions that you have so that you can have a smooth transition. But also, if you want one-on-one -on -one coaching through your entire process, we can figure that out and do something, but it's gonna come with a premium. It's not gonna be something cheap because time is money. And I, if, if I'm gonna put my time in to help you make money, I want something back in return. So if you're thinking about seriously getting coaching and getting acclimated to being over here on the continent, I got you, hit me up. Don't be afraid to reach out. All right, yeah. so without further ado, let's just say bye-bye to the people watching, all right? Peace. Peace, shalom.